Why do you think people seem to talk about UFC fighter pay? I also would like to get paid more my job, LOL. Listen, there aren't too many things you can talk about the UFC about. If you look at what we've done with the business in the last 22 years, it's incredible. Never been done ever, the things that we've done in the fight business. You always have to have something to bitch about, I guess. And fighters always want to make more money. Boxing has absolutely been destroyed because of money and, and, and all the things that go on. It's never going to happen while I'm here. Believe me, these guys get paid what they're supposed to get paid. They eat what they kill. They get a percentage of the pay-per-view buys. And the money is spread out amongst all the fighters. If you don't like it, there's a simple solution to this problem. Go start your own MMA organization. No buried entry. Knock yourself out. Pay them whatever you want to pay them. It's been done before. How's it worked out for other guys? Not well. Mind your business. Today, we'll talk about a businessman who has been running the biggest and most successful MMA organization in the whole world for almost 25 years. Every person who is more or less familiar with the mixed martial arts industry knows who Dana White is. We will try to figure out how an ordinary American guy reached these incredible heights in managing such a huge company and tell you about the story of this versatile human being without embellishment. First off, where are we right now? We're in my office. So we're at UFC headquarters, yeah. and this is my office. Your office is bigger than <laughs> houses, but you worked hard to get this. That's why I never trip off of anybody that has something. I'm like, man, I can't fault you for the hard work that you've done. But when I walked in here, Dane, I'm not going to bullshit you, bro. I felt like I'm not doing enough in my life. <laughs> Dana Frederick White Jr. was born on July 28th of 1969 in the United States of America, particularly in the city Manchester, Connecticut. He was the first child in the family. He has mixed roots being an Irish American. The majority of our hero's childhood took place in Ware State, Massachusetts. The boy was raised in a broken family, meaning in the traditional sense of that word. His father, Dana White Sr., started abusing alcohol when the kids were very young, which eventually led him to leaving home. It wasn't a spontaneous decision, but rather long years of drinking bouts, which made the parents split up. First of all, I, you know, I came from a family with a single mom. My dad was an alcoholic and was never around. And when he did show up, you didn't want him around. You know what I mean? He, he was usually drunk. Dana and his younger sister Kelly spent the larger part of their childhood in the care of their mother June and her side of the family. When Dana got to third grade, they moved to Las Vegas because mother, working as a nurse, was offered better money at a new job. The woman could hardly take care of two children and constantly change jobs. She worked multiple shifts to simply provide for her family. At first, it was quite tough for the boys. The teenager studied in Bishop Gorman High School, where he first got to know a man named Lorenzo Fatida. He was his classmate, and though they weren't best friends during their early childhood, eventually this name will be mentioned further in the story, so we suggest you not forget it. I, uh, you know, I wouldn't change one thing. Right. Every, everything that I went through as a kid made me who I am today. And I, and I wouldn't change it, you know, but, I, but my mom worked hard. She gave us the best life she could give us. I don't know how she did it sometimes, yeah, how man. she pulled it off as a single mom with a, with a dad that didn't pay anything and didn't care. Um, so I, I give her lots of credit for that. In childhood, White was a rather problematic and hyperactive child as he was kicked out of school at least a couple of times. He especially remembered one case that happened because of a fight. He saw a guy tormenting a frog and he beat him up for that. Another incident happened at the same place. Being an active, cheeky and insolent guy, White was once walking through the corridor in the school and saw an open door to one of the classrooms. They were left open so that the air conditioning could work properly. Dana did not care about that. He simply kicked the door and broke the hinges while the nun teacher was sitting in the classroom and saw all of that. I got kicked out of school for that, if you can believe that. <laughs> Dana lived in Nevada while he spent most of his time on studying, but in the summer, 
he, his mother and sister were going back to the East Coast to visit grandmother and grandfather who lived in Levant, state of Maine, a small town near Bangor. By the way, that's where the guy finished one of his last grades in high school of the same state. There is no information on which one. After graduating from Herman High School in 1987, our hero tried to enroll in college twice, at first in Quince and then in UMass Boston, but he dropped out each time during the first semester. It wasn't about White not being able to perform academically, he simply didn't like to study. He didn't like the idea that the system forces you to spend a few years on learning one specialty that is given batch wisely and watered down with a million other subjects not related to the field you're interested in. He wanted to act, and the sooner the better. He wanted to see the result of his efforts right here, right now. I'm a big guy on the American dream. The American dream is real. It's a real thing, and it's something that I really believe in. I fight for all the time. And Vegas, like, is, is, is the American dream. If you come here, mm -hmm. I don't care where you went to school, if you didn't go to school, you know, who you know, who you don't know. If you come to this city with a great idea and you work hard enough, work hard. This, this city will give you everything you ever dreamed. In the meantime, he changed the number of jobs. White worked as a black top paver, a bouncer at the local Irish club, and a runner in Boston Harbor Hotel. Namely, the latest working days in the hotel set him on the right path. Once he was doing his work and suddenly stopped, what am I doing here? Do I really want to spend my entire life on that? Flashed in his head. These questions were haunting him and he quit the job as soon as possible. We should also mention Dana White's experience in sports. In childhood, he trained in boxing and gymnastics, however, did not try to get to a professional level. It wasn't about fear, he just knew many athletes who dedicated all of their life to hard work but ultimately didn't achieve big success in the sport. The young man didn't want the same fate, that's why he didn't go to the big leagues. He was more thinking of how to start making money with those basic skills that he already had. Because he spent a couple of years fine-tuning his mastery and knew how to properly hit, stand and move all of this basic stuff. I wanted to learn every single piece of the business and I did everything. I mean, I trained, I boxed, I, I uh, refereed, I worked corners, uh, you know, I did everything. The fitness side of it was, you know, for me to have the ability to make money mm -hmm. and stay in the sport and learn everything that I could about the sport. You know, I just kept learning. It was like some kids go to college and, you know, I'm, 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 I'm in college for whatever major I'm in, but they don't really know what they want to do, right. but they know they want to, they think they want to be in this. I knew. I knew from the time that I was 19 years old that I wanted to be in the fight business. Working as a bouncer at the bar we mentioned earlier, he had time to attend boxing sessions and aerobics. After working at a few more places, he decided to develop his own method of preparation, kind of a set of boxing workouts. He was doing quite well for a while, however, he couldn't set the world on fire with that, so he abandoned this idea. In the beginning of the 1990s, the guy left Boston to return to Las Vegas after he was threatened by the members of the local Boston gang because he owed them money. But not exactly. In the 80s and 90s, people who ran the city were, so to say, managing all businesses, manufacturing and money flow, living in the shadows. We won't get into too much detail, as you very well know what we're talking about. So. They approached our hero who tried to make money selling his training programs and asked for their so-called share. Boston and boxing and everything that happened along the way is, is all, you know, part of the story and what, what, what led me here. Oh, yeah, so, so these guys rolled up on me one day at the gym and basically told me that I owed them money. And, uh, you know, they were, I, I said, you know, it was like 1500 bucks, 2500 bucks, whatever the number was at the time. But you might as well ask me for 25000 uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I didn't have it. And they said, get it from your fucking girlfriend. They knew I had a girlfriend. So, I said, yeah, she doesn't have it either. So, I just sort of blew it off and, uh, you know, lived my life, was doing my thing. And then, long story short, one day, 
I got a phone call at my house and they're basically like, you owe some money by tomorrow, one o'clock. I said, or what? Are you going to find out? So I literally hung up the phone. Hello, picked Delta, it back up and, Delta. You got <laughs> exactly what I did. I hung up, picked it back up and got a one-way flight to Vegas. Closer to 1992, our hero opened three gyms under the brand of Dana White Enterprises. All while doing business, White often dreamed of becoming a promoter. Since his early days, he was really passionate about the fighting sport and really wanted it to become part of his life. Since the aspiration to become an athlete went away on its own, Dana started learning about the specifics of different aspects of martial arts and gaining basic skills in management. He was absorbing knowledge like a thirsty man in a desert wishing for a sip of water. Even acting in the dark, he was still taking steps that, one way or another, led the guy to different stages and crossroads, giving him the needed experience in his sphere. And Peter and I did a deal with the city where we got the, the, the space uh, underneath the courthouse, which was all this, this whole concrete area. We put a, a ring in there, there were bags and everything else. And what we used to do was we used to bring kids in off the streets and Boston is very segregated especially back then you're talking you know back in the, in the late 80s <clears throat> and we used to bring kids in from all the different areas to come in and box and we wanted these kids to to sort of get to meet each other and 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 respect each other through box all kinds of books about martial arts attending local events around the city and nearby towns working as a referee cornerman and a coach he did everything to acquire all available information about the fighting industry and he did all of that on his own, dear friends. He didn't pay 25 to 50 bucks to some random people so they could work as a referee instead of him or just supervise the organization of events. He did everything himself from A to Z, took notes, pointed out advantages, got rid of all rubbish and put every essential detail in his notebook. At that time, I don't know if that's still the the narrative that's put on kids these days but at that time the big narrative was if you don't go to college you're never going to amount to anything and you're going to you know uh, you're going to be working these type of jobs for the rest of your life and i never necessarily believed that either i, mm. I believed that I, I knew what i wanted and i focused on it and i just went after it and i never cared about money money was never a a, a motivating factor for me being able to do what i wanted to do was what motivated me. And when you do what you do, and you do it well enough, the money just happens. Over time, after Dana moved to Las Vegas and made a fateful decision in his life, he gradually began to learn basics in management, promotion skills, and all the details related to martial arts. As we already said, all business ideas that Dana tried to develop in Boston were shattered. Besides the fact that he had some issues with the Mafia, he also had troubles with the tax system. In the end, he wrapped all of his projects and went free sailing in a huge city. After arriving in Sin City, our hero started getting old ties back. On one of the regular days, spending time at the wedding of his friend, he once again met with the Fatita brothers that we talked about earlier. Frank and Lorenzo were thriving businessmen who inherited the gambling business of their father and owned the biggest casino chain in the state of Nevada. In fact, the guys didn't have much in common with Dana besides old memories, friendship at school and love of martial arts. White didn't have a cent in his pockets, but he was inspired with thoughts and dreams about the fighting sport. What Dana has evolved into is literally the, the greatest fight promoter ever. I don't, you know, everybody talks about Don King, talk about Bob Arum. I don't think anybody has, has built and accomplished what, what Dana has. And he's taken on that role in such an, an amazing fashion. And, you know, um, he has the ability to really be out there, sell fights, understand what the consumer wants. I would say that Dana is, is really the mastermind behind a lot of the creative as far as kind of how the UFC is, you know, we sell to the consumers. For some time after reconnecting, the guys were attending boxing sessions together and then jiu-jitsu. At the workouts, they got to know many fighters of that era and put their sights on MMA. They were watching the first UFC tournaments and then, at a certain moment, they decided to attend the numbered event in person. 
Watching the action, they constantly shared their thoughts and opinions on how they could improve the quality of what they saw before their eyes. Looking from the outside, Dana saw a lot of options of how he could sophisticate the organization of different aspects, which in his opinion, were destined to be successful. We fell in love with it. We started training three, four days a week. Um, we'd all try to learn more than the other ones so we could submit them next time we wrestled. And through that, we started to meet some of the fighters. And then we were blown away by the fighters. These guys were smart, they were incredible athletes. And uh, then we went to our first UFC event and we sat in the crowd and started to go, man, imagine if they did this, and imagine if they did that, this thing could be big. Eventually, close relationships and continuous communication with professional fighters led our hero to becoming the manager who represented their interests. The first line of performers Dana worked with were Tito Ortiz and Chuck Liddell. At that moment, he was already scheming some plans for further development in the fighting industry, but he wasn't in a hurry. He needed a better understanding on how management works in this sphere and what hidden catches he might encounter on his way to success. The last person on earth you want to butt heads with is the government. You do not want to butt heads with the right. government. So, and, and, and the reality was, as we got involved in this sport and started to learn more about it, like you said, when I started to work with Tito and Chuck, as we started to learn about the sport, we were blown away by it, by what great athletes these guys were. Most of these guys graduated from college. You know, all these myths about this sport were, were, were just that. They, they, they were myths, none of it was true. It was basically old marketing by the old owners just to make it sound crazy. If some of you didn't know, the UFC promotion was founded in 1993 and its main goal was to identify the most efficient martial art. In just a couple of years, literally by the end of the 90s, the bosses of the promotion managed to amass a big fan base that loved watching all the early tournaments and bought tickets for months ahead. However, their creation was successful only from the outside. In reality, the heads of the company couldn't afford to broadcast their events on the television and buy ads in the newspapers. The reason for that was excessive violence that all media outlets didn't want to deal with. In a million years, these guys never thought they were creating a sport. The first UFC was put on by this guy, he was a television guy, and it was supposed to be, let's answer the age-old question of which fighting style is the best. Will a karate guy beat a kung fu guy? Will a wrestler beat a boxer? We'll put on this one-time pay-per-view and we'll see how it goes. Well, they put on their first pay-per-view and it was huge. It, it rivaled the WWE and big boxing events at the time. So of course they're going to do another one. So they did another and another and another. After diving into the MMA industry, Dana saw many small details and problems that were inevitably leading to the promotion's total fall. He was especially impressed with the negotiations of one local organization and protraction from the previous owner on the subject of Tito's further career, who was already competing in the UFC for some time, which eventually left Dana White with bad aftertaste. It was going out of business. It was basically going out of business. This guy, you know, I don't know if he had the money or didn't, but was not willing to fund it anymore. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it, it was at the end of his rope. It was going out of business. And through that, I found out that the UFC was in trouble. And like I said, Lorenzo and I were going to get involved in boxing. They were down in Miami. I called them and said, I think this thing's in trouble. I think we could buy the UFC. And a month later, we owned the company. In January of 2001, brothers Frank and Lorenzo Fatita bought the organization called Ultimate Fighting Championship. The total sum of that acquisition was $2 million. After closing the deal, they assigned White as the president, giving him 9% of the overall income. And that's how Dana stepped on a new path he has been striving for all these years. Getting a little bit ahead, since that moment he is a permanent head of the promotion, who made a lot of significant contributions in the development and popularization of the MMA sport around the world. And what's amazing about the UFC and the first UFC is that since 1993, martial arts has evolved more than it has in the last 10,000 years. And it's continuing to evolve because of the UFC. But let's get back. At first, the guys didn't see any huge success at all as they just recently bought the company which had one foot deep in the grave. 
Moreover, despite the big plans of improving and developing this business, three of them faced tons of problems. You know, it was a, a business that we were all passionate about, a business that we all believed in, but we had those conversations like, you know what, how far are we willing to go? You know, uh, an investment that we thought was two million has all of a sudden turned into 30, 40 million dollars. And there's no end in sight. This could easily turn into a hundred million dollars uh, real quick, because every single show we did, uh, we were losing money on. Let's put it like this. For those two million dollars, the Fatita brothers essentially bought three letters, UFC, with a wooden table for negotiations and an octagon in one of the city's premises. And not long before selling the company, the former owner gave away all of the attributes related to the company, basically for free, including the DVD rights, merchandise and everything required to promote the brand. And it was Dana White who had a responsibility to retrieve all of that stuff back to the world's best league. On top of that, as we said earlier, one of the main problems of UFC's early stage was the fact that they didn't have any reputation. The former owners presented the promotion in such a light that it was perceived as nothing but a theatre of violence and brutality with no rules or restrictions. Such aggressive marketing led to the company losing its place on television and check this out, their tournaments were banned in 36 states. The, the, the crazy thing about this is when you start, again, when you start looking at the money side of this thing and you say, what if the Fertitas wanted to sell this? Understand, it's a business. And in business, everything is always for sale. You know, But right now, and this might be arrogant, but it's truly what we believe, that we're the only guys that can do this. We're the only guys that can take this thing to where uh, it needs to be. We're, the, we're definitely the guys that love it, are passionate about it, and have the roadmap for where this thing's gonna go. Our hero tirelessly worked on changing the public's perception of mixed martial arts. Just so you understand how bad it was in this regard, the Senator John McCain himself called the UFC a form of human cockfighting. And partially, it was true. White himself agreed with such a statement. The former owners were putting on crazy shows which did not resemble a sport, and only when White and the Fatita brothers started running the company, things began changing for the better. Only when White started handling all these issues, the company began working with athletic commissions, introduced a rule set and strict weight classes, and only after that, so-called fights with no rules began shaping into something resembling a real sport. Yeah, so, so our philosophy was, we think if we do this the right way, build this like a real sport and these are real athletes, we think this thing could really be big someday. And the question is always about timing. Is the timing right or not? And, and thank God the timing actually was perfect. Thanks to all these innovations, which truly looked like something that had a right to exist, the UFC made a big step forward. After infinite negotiations, the company's representatives achieved the possibility to put on events in the state of Nevada, and later got back on the market of pay-per-views. After all this bureaucracy and wandering from one authority to another, the promotion got everything it needed to function properly. The debut of the new owners happened on February the 23rd of 2001 at the 30th numbered event called the all-new Ultimate Fighting Championship, the Battle on the Boardwalk. That was the moment when Dana White appeared in public for the first time in a new role and shared some plans for the bright future on live broadcast. Dana White, President of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Dana, congratulations on your first show. That's got to feel good. Thank you very much, James. I appreciate it. We're very excited. we got a sellout crowd here, 5,000 people, revved and ready to go. The rebirth of the UFC and its new start gave the owners hope that they could really turn this thing into something big. The ambitions of the company's main CEO were through the roof. He clearly knew what he wanted to achieve and what he had to do to fulfill these goals. However, if we're being honest, at first things weren't as good as they wanted it to be. Even after getting all the required permissions for their business and having a fan base, it was quite hard for the promotion to get rid of all the prejudices and the fact that they were perceived as freaks who were putting on brutal massacres to entertain boozers and rubbernecks. In the eyes of the majority of the public, they still presented themselves as a barbaric activity that no big brand or sponsor wanted to be associated with. 
So there was a point in time where I was so focused on where I was going to go and, and, and my career, right? Wherever that was going to take me. We, we could be friends for whatever. I didn't go to anybody's wedding. Right. I didn't go to Focus. anybody's. You know, you know that, that, that point in your life when all your friends start to get fucking married? Yeah. It's like wedding after fucking wedding after. And I'm out. Why? I'm, I, I'm too busy. This. Yeah, I don't have time for that kind of shit. Dana and the Fatita brothers were unsuccessful in negotiating with anybody on the matter of advertising contracts, but already by 2002, they were on the verge of collapse. Everybody refused to work with their brainchild and didn't want to even sit down for the talks. The lowest point was um, when Lorenzo called me and said, I can't keep funding this thing. Man. I, can't, I can't call my brother again to ask him to fund this thing. I needed to get out there and see what we can get for this thing. I started making calls all that day, and uh, I call, he called me back that night, and I said, I don't know, man. six, maybe eight million? He said, all right, I'll call you tomorrow. We repeat that during the first year, the Fatita brothers invested around $44 million in the UFC, and though the organization managed to make its activity legal, returned to the television and signed many legends of the sport, with every tournament they put on, they were losing a lot of money. After that very call, Dana White figured that his friends were free to act in accordance with their interests, especially in such a bad situation. However, they weren't cold-blooded businessmen who only think about quick money. The Fatitas believed in their love for martial arts and their friend. So when Lorenzo called Dana the next day, he told him that they were planning to keep working and were not willing to sell anything. First of all, one thing about me is, I love adversity. You know what I mean? Some people fold yeah. under adversity. Some people can't deal with chaos. Some people mm -hmm. can't handle the pressure. I love that I, I that's what gets me up in the morning. I eat that for breakfast. Negativity on, on, on social media, negativity from the media, negativity from whoever they are that are out there talking I love that And that's what motivates me and gets me going. So the more you give me, the more you energize me, the more you, you, you make me go. I, I can't explain it to you. I thrive in chaos. Finally, after jumping through the same hoops and hitting the wall time and time again, our hero made a decision to change direction and approach. The main idea that struck White was the fact that the viewers and fans don't see professional fighters as the same human beings as they are. They don't have interest in the personalities of these athletes. It made Dana think about a reality show. To put this idea to life, he reached out to the representatives of the famous producer, Craig Pillagian. After having a talk, they came up with a format for the TV show, the point of which was to put a number of fighters under the same roof. In turn, they have an opportunity to fight for the UFC contract under the supervision of star coaches, and the name of the show was the following, The Ultimate Fighter. That first season of The Ultimate Fighter was a nightmare. Um, half, first of all, you're right, they didn't believe in it. They let us buy our way onto Spike TV. We do, 10 million bucks. And the first season starts airing and just starts climbing, pulling numbers. By, see, by episode five, when the big blowout with Chris Lieben and Koscheck happens, uh, we do 2.1 million viewers. The president of the network gets fired. Everything shuts down, man. And no contact with Spike TV whatsoever. So I'm freaking out. So I'm flying back and forth from New York to Vegas, New York to Vegas, New York to Vegas, trying to figure out what's going on. People right. are basically just hiding in their cubicles, hoping they're not next. And it literally went right down to the wire. The minute I knew was when Stephen Bonner and Forrest Griffin fought. When that fight ended, we knew we had something special. We knew it was, it was a done deal. The Ultimate Fighter was the last hope for the UFC, the Fatita brothers, and Dana White in particular. All of them knew that if this idea wouldn't be successful, there would be no turning back and they would have to sell the company for pennies while sustaining huge damages. 
We should also mention that none of the TV channels were looking to invest in the project, which was still considered shady due to a bad reputation. As the organization's president already said himself in an interview, they ultimately managed to sign a contract with Spike TV, but it was a drive to desperate shifts. The Fatitas paid for the show by themselves, then it was the case for Small to find telepresence. Why did the channel representatives agree to that, though they declined the deal of the promotion numerous times in the past? Because it was a win-win deal for them. Everything was paid for by the initiators of this show. They were just giving them the mere opportunity to broadcast, though they still doubted the success of this idea. To their surprise, the very first episode of the debut season was viewed by more than a million people. And for that time, these were unprecedented numbers and they were only getting bigger with each subsequent episode. Lorenzo calls me up and says, what's going on? I'm, I'm here at the Ultimate Fighter gym and these guys are saying they're not gonna fight. I was like, what? Yeah, apparently they, they wanna be paid or they're not gonna fight and all this stuff. So you have to understand at that time, the pressure and the stress that we're under, this is the last shot. If, if this thing doesn't work, the UFC is done. I'm not happy right now. I have the feeling that some guys here that don't wanna fight. I don't know if that's true or not true or whatever, but I don't know what the everybody thought they were coming here for. Does anybody here not want to fight? Speak up. Anybody who, who came here thinking they weren't going to fight, speak up. Let me hear it. Let me explain something to everybody. This is a very, and when I say very, I can't explain to you what a unique opportunity this is. You have nothing to worry about every day, except coming in and getting better at what supposedly you want to do for a living. As Dana White already stated himself, the main fight in the UFC which laid the path for their entire business took place at the end of the season, when Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonner shared the octagon and fought for a contract with the organization. Just so you know, the hype around this fight was so huge that this brawl was watched live by 12 million people. Namely, these veterans, without any exaggeration, saved the promotion and the entire MMA industry. They changed the direction of the sport and put it on another level, allowing the world's best league to broadcast the biggest events in the world of mixed martial arts and putting them in demand. We do venues where we do stadiums, you know, yeah. we do stadium shows, we do things like this. You know, it is the best live sporting event you will go to. There's two different shows. We have an in-house show for the people who are there live, and then we have a television show. Mm -hmm. But that has been built off years of trial and error and learning. A week after the final stage in Tough, there was the 52nd numbered event where Iceman was up against Randy Couture. The main event in the form of a fight between two star coaches of the season managed to sell 300,000 PPVs, which happened to be another record in the history of the rising company. Hopping on a wave of long-awaited success, the world's best league signed a multi-million dollar contract with Spike TV and the Ultimate Fighter show was automatically extended for the second season and this time, the TV company took care of the costs itself. UFC finally managed to get out of the crisis where they have been for all these years and ultimately got a deserved recognition for their efforts. Those first five years were the toughest for the representatives of the organization, but they managed to withstand and overcame all the doubts from the public. Precious time supported by efforts and faith in his cause brought our hero to the very top despite the statements from credible sources and successful businessmen. I, I don't know if I've really changed that much. I mean, if you, if you talk to a lot of people that have known me for a long time, I've obviously made more money and stuff like that. but. I haven't changed much, man. I mean, in 2016, when we when we sold to Endeavor, um, you know, this was almost like a Microsoft type situation. People made a lot of money, and some of the people, Joe Silva left, and some other people who worked here left, and they don't work anymore, and they do whatever. I, I've been here the whole time. I get here at 8:30 in the morning, and I I got here last night at 8:30. I left here at 8:30 last night, so not much has changed with me. Throughout the next five years, the premier fighting promotion continued to grow. In those times, their main competition was smaller leagues like Strikeforce, WEC and Pride. They were not looking to take on the UFC. 
During said time, they bought all three organizations and took in possession all of their assets, including fighters with active contracts. Overall, if we round it up a little, the costs of these deals were around $100 million, but it was worth it, no doubt. Dozens of young and promising fighters got on the roster, including stars and legends known around the world. Thus, the UFC conquered the entire MMA market. We've done so many things in the fight business that have never been done yet, and we continue to do that. Our, our motto around here is be first. Soon, the promotion was about to have a global expansion. With every year, their creation continued to grow, got into new markets, and appeared in different countries. The monopolization of all industries and organizations was performed to make sure that the league could put on as many events as possible and had enough fighters to represent the sport in all corners of the world. By the end of the 2000s, the UFC shaped into what we can see today, got to the top of the food chain and presented the biggest numbered event of that time. It happened to be the anniversary tournament UFC 100 in the main event of which there was a fundamental battle between Brock Lesnar and Frank Mir. This fight managed to set another record in the form of 1,600,000 PPVs, bringing the revenue of $80 million in one night. So everybody starts diving into this thing. Well, it's easy, right? Just throw three letters together and buy a cage and put on fights. Anybody could do that, so these guys go out and the biggest mistake that everybody makes when they try to compete with us is they try to compete with us. First of all, we didn't come out yesterday and put together an organization and now we're on Fox and now we're on pay-per-view. Anything you do, nothing, nothing, is, nothing happens overnight, man. It's, it seems that way, but it's all hard work. I have been on planes, trains, and automobiles for the last 13 years out selling the sport, getting deals done, getting doors slammed on my face. Um, you name it, it's all happened. When we talk about the story of Dana White, which can't be described to the fullest extent without touching on his connection with the major promotion, here are a few words about his conflict with one of the fighters of that time. As you remember, when our hero was immersing into the realm of MMA and got to know different representatives of the sport, he had time to work as a manager for a number of performers. One of them happened to be one of the first trash talkers and so-called bad guys of the old school era, Tito Ortiz. Those guys don't like each other, there's no love lost there. I'd like to see Dana just punish him. I don't know why Dana would want to fight one of his employees. Just look at it, he's a businessman, Tito's a professional fighter. There's no brainer in that one. I have no idea why Tito would want to do this because if he does lose, that is going to be really embarrassing for him. This is a huge lose-lose situation for me and my brother Frank. Either one of the top fighters in mixed martial arts gets outboxed by a 37-year-old executive or my best friend gets hurt. After a certain period of time, the relationship between these guys turned very bad. The reason was that when the company achieved success, the UFC president terminated the previous contract with Ortiz, focusing on his new protege, whom he wanted to turn into the biggest star, Chuck Liddell. Such a shift gave birth to not only the most unique conflict in the history of the promotion, but also gave us one of the most legendary trilogies in MMA. Dana was traveling with Iceman around the world and presented him as an example of a perfect fighter, while in regard to Ortiz, he was saying completely different stuff. I hated him with a passion. I mean, I hated this guy to the point where, you know, I can honestly say I don't think I've ever hated anybody worse than I hated Tito at that time. White called Ortiz the most stupid creature on earth, while the latter attended the ceremonial weigh-ins wearing a shirt that said, Dana White is my in 2006, Tito beat Ken Shamrock for the third time, and after that there was a rumor about a boxing match between White and Ortiz. Soon, the rumor was confirmed. Even the Spike TV channel announced their fight with $15 for a PPV. Lorenzo Fatita created an individual contract, which stated the date and venue, and also the main condition. The fight would be under boxing rules, three three-minute rounds. Bottom line is I said I'd do this, 
and I'm gonna have to train the best I can train for it, and we'll do it. it gives a shit what happens. You know what I mean? This is between me and Tito. I'm not trying to win any world titles or anything like that. We got some bad blood. He wants to box three rounds with me. We're gonna do it. You know, maybe I'll outbox him, or he's gonna knock me the f out. Whatever happens, happens. We have a deal. Deal's a deal, and we're gonna do it. Unfortunately, or luckily, this fight didn't actually happen. But again, there was a full-blown build-up, archives of all interactions between White and Tito, and even training camps. Over time, this whole thing gradually fell through. Later, we found out about a brawl between the two guys on a private jet. Ortiz took Dana's neck in a lock as a joke, but when Dana tapped as a sign of surrender, he didn't let go of the choke. The UFC president was hitting him with a kitchen sink until the Fatita brothers stepped in. And then it turned into a real fight, so the plane that was flying to Japan got very shaky. He blinked. He did. He blinked. Could you have won? Yeah, I would have won. I absolutely would have won that boxing match. Ultimately, later, they resolved all of their issues, the veteran was inducted in the Hall of Fame, and this conflict got settled down. Let's pick up where we left off. Given a mass popularization of MMA, the world's best league got to a point where by 2011, they reached an agreement with the big channel, Fox. The contract's term was seven years, and the overall sum that the organization made from that deal was more than $700 million. Since that moment, the fighting tournaments have been broadcasted in 130 countries and translated to at least 20 languages. Right after this truly historic deal, mixed martial arts reached a worldwide level because it got an opportunity to be broadcasted all over the globe. For the next five years, the major promotion was thriving like never before and became absolutely huge. The company's active roster had 600 fighters that represented more than 60 countries. New stars were born who perfectly fit into the fighting game and began representing combat sports under the UFC brand. It was an unprecedented success. The creation of Dana White and the Fatita brothers became the leader and started to be associated with the sport known in every corner of the world. One of the things that you have to really stay focused on is not losing your mind. I get in here every day, 8.30, 9 o'clock. I leave every day at 7.30, quarter to 8, okay? I'm here all day, every day. And the things that I focus on is the live event, on television and in-house, mm -hmm. finding up-and-coming talent, and putting on the best fights that I can possibly put on. Mm -hmm. Now, if I stay focused on that, you can't f this thing up. You know what I mean? You can't forget who you are, because you can get out there and start worrying about, listen, video games and all that other stuff is great, but if without the core of right. what this business really is, none of that shit matters. Before the beginning of 2016, it was smooth sailing. The number of stars and PPVs were getting bigger and bigger, while the UFC was signing contracts with worldwide brands whose logos appeared on the Octagon's canvas from event to event, until there were rumors about a potential selling of the company. At first, the president of the organization denied all of these speculations and answered the journalists' questions rather briefly. However, later, these rumors were confirmed. In July, the world got struck with the news that the media conglomerate of the Hollywood agent Ari Manuel acquired the promotion for $4 billion. As a result of this deal, the Fatita brothers sold all of their assets and left the business. White was not willing to go anywhere. He kept his share of 9% and his position in the company. Three days ago, we filmed the first episode of The Ultimate Fighter. It was 20 years to the day that we filmed the first Ultimate Fighter. 20 years. And we're still doing the show. And uh, I was in my office, I'm like, I gotta go over there and film the Ultimate Fighter right now. Blah, blah, blah. Then when I went over there, and they opened the doors, and I walked in, and the kids, the, my arms, I walked in, and the kids were standing in there, and I saw their faces, and I, I, I felt that. Look at, look at my arms. I, I felt that energy. I don't know what, and I was like, 
this, this is still awesome. At first, the further prospects under the wing of new owners were quite vague. However, the very next year was a lot better. Interesting formulation, of course, like how anything can be better, but it's true. The major promotion put on fights between many different performers whose appearance was really appreciated by the public. And in 2018, there was the biggest fight in the history of the UFC with no exaggeration. The infamous clash between Habib Nurmagomedov and Conor McGregor amassed more than 2,400,000 PPV buys, setting the new, unattainable record in the history of the fighting organization. In the meantime, the UFC had a deal with the biggest sports broadcaster in the United States called ESPN for the next five years. The sum of the deal was $1.5 billion. Would you say that this has been the biggest thing to happen to the UFC, this ESPN deal? Yeah, it's absolutely. I mean, a lot of big things have happened to us over the years, but once you make it to ESPN, that's when you, you know you've made it as a sport. And right now, if you look at our deal, where we're at, what we're doing, we're now one of the top four sports in the United States. The big four has changed. Exactly. The big four has changed. We are one of them. After closing the most important deal in the organization's history, and up until the pandemic, the premier fighting promotion was showing record-setting ratings which were only getting bigger. Only when the world was put on pause did things change a little bit, but not in a way many people thought. Yeah, so yesterday the governor of Brazil issued a decree uh, limiting the size of public events. So we are going to do the event live from Brasilia um, on ESPN and ESPN Plus tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, Saturday, and, uh, and we're, we're, we're going ahead with it. You can't have over 100 people there, so we will just have the staff that's running the event inside the arena that night. Despite such a situation, Dana White managed to find a solution. The promotion used a special island in Abu Dhabi where they continued to put on events in accordance with COVID restrictions. Just think about it, when absolutely everything was put on hold, all businesses around the world were sustaining huge damages. The company of our hero kept on setting new records. Just recently, getting on the list of the big four, UFC was the only sports league in the world that continued to work during the pandemic. Dana White was doing everything so that his staff could keep their jobs, fighters continued to perform and compete, while the sport continued to grow. During that tough year, the promotion put on around 40 events and expanded their fan base, and overall, one could say that it left another mark in history because despite any circumstances, it kept on functioning and doing what others thought was impossible. We built something special here, and we all love what we do, and it's. It's, it's fun. We're like a, a, a big family here. And uh, that's why when COVID hit, I was so adamant about going through COVID and not laying off any of my people. And we'd figure it out and we all stuck together. And then when it was time to work, when I did figure it out, and I'm sure, I'm not saying everybody, there weren't some people that were scared and wondering what was, they all went to war with me, man. We all went out and we, and we did it. And uh, I, I think since that's happened, we've become even closer. And, uh, you know, here as a, as a team, and uh, we all love what we do. So, yes, it was hard, um, but yet at the same time, you know, like they always say, it, it's really all about the journey. And yeah. We've had a really incredible journey. As of today, the UFC is the biggest and most demanded brand in mixed martial arts that has been representing this sport on world arenas for more than 30 years now. When Dana White, being a simple clerk with dreams and plans for the future, came into this business, it was no more than just a freak show with no reputation, which seemed to be unable to restore a normal perception from the public. Only thanks to his efforts, work ethic and big love for this thing, the promotion managed to rise like a phoenix and reach a level of a credible company that sets a standard all over the world. In the past, the world's best league was bought for $2 million and for a long time has been on the verge of bankruptcy. Right now, its capitalization is worth $13 billion. Thousands and thousands of people work for its prosperity every single day. 
Thanks to their hard work, the company turned into a multi-billion dollar corporation and the league is not willing to stop on that. However, none of that could be achieved without this American guy who doesn't have a higher degree and who knew from his childhood that his life should be dedicated to the fighting industry. In pursuit of his dream, Dana White went through a very thorny path, which brought him the long-awaited results after many years of persistent work and commitment. On top of that, he never really distinguished himself as a big-headed and conceited businessman who cares only about zeros in his bank account. First of all, he has always been and will be working for the good of mixed martial arts, which he had faith in already decades ago. After all, he is the same human as we are, a versatile, sometimes grumpy, with principles, but still a human. I would be, if this wasn't happening right now, I'd be in the fight business anyway. This is what I love to do. I made this decision when I was 19 years old. So it's kind of tough talking about my work ethic because there, for me, there's no days off. There's no holidays. I'm on the phone Christmas Day. What used to drive me crazy when we were building this company, you know, we, we, we do deal a lot with entertainment. You know, we're, we're, we're on television, we're in the pay-per-view business, um, and the list goes on and on. DVDs, you name it, we're in every bit of the entertainment business as anybody else in any other business. Around Christmas time, Hollywood shuts down from December 12th and they don't come back till like a week after uh, uh, New Year. It used to drive me insane. It felt like you couldn't get anything done. So when these big major holidays come, all these other people that take holidays and they're on vacation, we don't. We keep right on cranking, keep working, we're on the phone every day. Christmas day I'm doing stuff. I don't know, I don't, I don't know if you ever really clear your mind because I, the, the reality is I have kids too. So the time that I don't spend working, you know, where I'm not physically working, I'm with my kids, hanging out with my kids. I, I do two things, I work and I hang out with my kids. And anybody who has kids knows there's never any really downtime. I am, when I, I devote so much time and energy to this, when I'm with my kids, I'm their slave. I do whatever they want me to do, whatever they tell me to do, wherever they want to go, I am their slave. I do whatever they want to do. The, the only thing I want for my kids is that they're happy. I don't care what they do for a living. I'm not one of these guys that's like, you know, oh, you got to go to med school and be a lawyer and all this other bull I, I, I literally want my kids to be happy. I don't care what they do, as long as they're happy. One of the things I did when they were very young is I got them into surfing when they were babies. I love the whole surf culture and, and, and everything. I hope one of them or all three of them just become surfers and just travel the world and surf and don't give a shit about anything. That, that, so that, great. That, I would be happy for them if that was their deal. You I expect what, nothing from them except to be happy. And in the end, here's a compilation of the best and most typical moments of Dana White to remember. What Scrap the f are you asking me right now? You know, uh, this was a big event for us tonight. This was a, 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 a really big moment. I was really excited. I've been here, I've been fired up. I've been on the road a lot, and uh, this whole last, uh, you know, three weeks of my life was leading leading to this night here. The people in this country, including the media, have really got behind this thing, and with support like I've never, ever seen anywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really embarrassed. And the thing you have to understand is, this sport is 18 years old. And when you're talking about when Chuck and Tito fought, that's another thing he said. He said that, that, you know, that Chuck Liddell and Tito fought and Chuck made $200,000 and we did 1.5 million pay-per-view buys. First of all, the first fight with Chuck and Tito was April 2nd, 2004. We bought the company in 2001 and the thing did 106,000 buys. Lied again. But what I'm saying is... But, but this Oscar's isn't a bigger situation. This is about this idiot coming on this show and lying. Right. He's a liar. That he stayed away, that you're disgusted. If you ever watch Mazzagotti ref a fight, he f***ing stands there like this. He's doing his f***ing grocery list, thinking about what he, did he TiVo the f***ing, uh, his favorite show? I, I don't know what the f*** this guy's doing. Or sometimes he'll go like this and start looking like this when they're not even f***ing doing anything. When they're doing f***ing, he's not in there when he's supposed to be in there. Unlike the guy has no idea what he's looking at. I said it a long time ago. The guy shouldn't even be watching MMA on television, let alone f***ing refing it. Who do you like this weekend? Cain Velasquez or 
Brock Lesnar. Yo mama. <laughs> I just can't take you seriously dressed like this Euro trash. <laughs> Look at him, right? Euro trash going to a club, except before we had this tucked into his boots. That's f***ing illegal.